As we've transitioned into uh, the season of Easter, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, we've transitioned our sermon series as well. What we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks is called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And what we're going to focus on is what happens when people come to Jesus in a hard place. When times are tough, when things are difficult, when they're struggling or ill, what happens when people come to Jesus? And we're going to recognize him as the rock, and we're going to do so because of a text we're going to read in just a moment, coming out of the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus talks about, like the video just said, building your life on a rocky, solid foundation. Now, I've done a little bit of foundation work in my life. I'm by no means an expert. I once went on a mission trip to Puerto Rico thinking that we were going to build a building on the back of a church to help a local church in rural Puerto Rico. When I got there, what I found was that ladders were hanging on power cords and not on actual uh, strong things. We weren't leaning it up against walls. I was there with a friend of mine who was an engineer, and he must have complained about how far we were outside of OSHA standards all week long. On the mission field, OSHA doesn't exist. You get the job done with what you can get it done, apparently. And all of the really, really skilled, hard labor of building ceilings and frames and and, uh, putting all that stuff together was apparently going to be done by the locals who are coming out in droves to help. And so my unskilled self got left with building a foundation. And it turns out that in July in Puerto Rico, it's really hot. And when it's really hot, doing foundation work is very hard. Because what foundation work in Puerto Rico exists of is mostly just loading up wheelbarrows with massive rocks and pushing them all day. I have just a couple of pictures for you to see of some of the work that I did that week. There are some of the people that were on my team with me as we moved. The, the, what, that was one of the pile of rocks that we moved into place. And then we had to move it into, you could see on... Uh, It's my left, I'm guessing it's your right of the screen, a frame that we built along the bottom and had to just move rocks into there and then beat them down and keep building smaller and smaller rocks up. I think there's one more picture of our work that week. There we go. There's proof that I did work, at least kind of, with the shovel. And that's my niece right in front of me, Sammy. We were moving rocks all week. Doing foundation work is very, very difficult. Whether you are a professional or whether you're a volunteer, building a foundation out of solid rock is hard work. And so it's appropriate metaphor that Jesus gives us on the back end of the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus has laid foundation work for us. 
And I think that when we read the Sermon on the Mount, we appropriately read it as hard work. These things that Jesus are suggesting is difficult stuff. And so Jesus will say things like, you have heard it said, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not divorce, do not break your oath, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Jesus says, you have heard these things, but I tell you to go a step further. And as we're reading this, it could just feel so like the walls are closing in on us. It's not enough to not murder. Have you tried to homeschool my kids lately? Right? We feel like this, this sense of like controlling our frustration at the way that the world can be sometimes. And as we do that, we feel like just bottling it up is enough because people don't see. But Jesus says, no, take it a step further. Don't even be angry. Don't even let anger overwhelm you, he says. He says, uh, lust is every bit as bad in the same as adultery. He says, do not simply take oaths, but, but take seriously every word that you speak. He says, do not, uh, do not simply uh, go by the saying, eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, but do not even resist an evil one. Walk an extra mile for them. Give them another coat if they steal yours as well. He says it's not enough to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but he, that you should love your enemies as much as you love your neighbors and friends. And as you go through this teaching of Jesus, you, you may be able to think, I don't know how I can ever even aspire to live up to this calling that Jesus is putting on my life. It's so difficult to imagine controlling my anger or my passions. But... It's incredibly important to see the context here of where Jesus is speaking and then who Jesus is on the other side of this text. First of all, this is called the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus goes up a mountain for what I think is a very, very strong image for the Jewish people who are wondering if he's the Messiah. Because it's up on the mountain that these teachings that they're hearing were first given, Moses, after leaving, leading the people of God out of bondage and slavery into a new life and a new world and a new promised land, they needed to uh, orient themselves around a story and laws. And so Moses, in order to do this, didn't just go into a closed tabernacle and write down some laws. He climbed up a mountain and met with God. And when God met with Moses on the mountain, he gave him the Ten Commandments, which became the story around the Israelites had formed themselves throughout their entire history. And so Jesus is doing the same thing, but he's reorienting this law. You see, when the people go up the mountain, they go and they meet Jesus, who is God. And he is re-narrating and re-teaching and re-imagining the law in which the Israelites had lived around them. And the law had become so much like a noose to them, they couldn't live up to it themselves. It was so difficult to aspire to be what God had asked them to be. And so when Jesus goes up on the mountain, he's bringing with him this image, this imagination of Moses going up onto the mountain. And Jesus is re-narrating who the people of God are going to be and what we are called to do. And he re-narrates it much less around strict laws, do this, then that. Instead, he orients it around the sort of hearts that we are to have, the sort of people that we are to ha be, the sort of dispositions that we're supposed to evoke and give out to, for the sake of the world. And so Jesus is matching Moses on top of the mountain here. But when he comes down the mountain, this becomes the really, really important thing that I want to talk about as we move into the rest of this series. When Jesus comes down the mountain, he is the anti-Moses. The story is pretty famous. Moses gets the Ten Commandments. He's been in the presence of God. He's amazed at the power and presence and word of God. He comes down with a word to give the people. The Ten Commandments are etched on stone tablets that God's own finger has written. And Moses is on a spiritual high coming down the mountain, right? And he gets to the bottom and what he finds is a people who still remain in their sin. And he looks around and he sees his own brother leading the charge of melting every piece of gold they have into a false god, a golden calf, so that they could have something tangible to worship. 
And Moses, you may recall, has a temper tantrum of a three-year-old. He looks like a coach screaming in a locker room after a bad loss. He takes the tablets that were once so meaningful to him that God himself had written, and he begins to break the tablets and scream and yell, and he is furious and storms back up the mountain to see God again. Jesus does something very, very different after this text. Jesus comes down the mountain, and as he walks down the mountain, he begins to run into people who are in desperate need. Jesus sees a man with leprosy and hears his story. And he doesn't condemn him. He doesn't question what caused him to have leprosy. If there was a spiritual condition, he heals him. And then Jesus runs into a centurion who is considered to be an enemy of the people of Israel. And as he listens to the faith of this centurion, he lauds his faith and tells him that he will as well see that his servant will be healed. And on and on the stories go of Jesus calming storms, restoring people who are ill. For all of the big language that Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount, he's approachable and grace-filled, restorative and healing. And so at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, which bridges the gap between the hard teachings and the graceful, compassionate Jesus is a fairly familiar story, which you may have guessed we'll read today by, by the bumper video leading us in. But I'm going to read just about six verses uh, from Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verses 24 to 29, the story of the wise and foolish bil <clears throat> builders. And these are the final words that Jesus teaches in his Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet, it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. This is the word of the Lord. So for as difficult as these words that Jesus could teach in the Sermon on the Mount... He, he's making the argument that the way that people are living is like building on sandy ground. We would never build on sandy ground because we know that that's not foundation enough to put a house on. Instead, he's saying, look around at the ways that seem so difficult compared to the way that I'm teaching. Look at the ways it seems so natural, so simple, me-centered living, uh, me-first imaginations. Look at these ways that people are living, and their worlds crumble so easily when things go wrong, when things are difficult. What's interesting about this image that Jesus gives us of the, the houses being built on sandy and rocky ground is Jesus knows that the streams are going to rise and the winds are going to come and the rains are going to come. We can't escape out of this life without difficulty. But he's trying to re-narrate for us a life that can withstand the troubled and difficult times. We live now in troubled and difficult times, to say the least. Socially distanced, teaching at home, learning how to work on screen, distanced from each other. Some have lost jobs, some are struggling financially, some are on the edge of their mental health because of the lack of connection or ability to, to meet with counselors or, or um, psychiatrists. There's so much that feels like it's just teetering on the edge. And so we very much live in this time that Jesus is talking about where the streams rise and the winds come and our houses are getting pelted. And Jesus is saying, if you can build your life on me, my, my foundation is a rock. It's solid. It's eternal. 
It will help you. It won't help you avoid difficult seasons. It won't give you an opportunity to avoid hard times. People who are in Christ are struggling right now every bit as much as those who are not. But Jesus says, my way of life will allow a foundation of solidness that will allow you to find that you can withstand this time better than other times. What I think is often the stumbling block for people about coming to Christ is the teachings, that it seems hard, that they have to change so much. Life has to get reoriented. And and that may be true. It's not easy to take a full 90-degree turn of your life or 180-degree turn of your life and to change so much. But Jesus always offers grace and not punishment. And the grace is, is he's saying this life that he's offering to us is one that is a foundation that's firm for whatever is to come in this world. Jesus is not trying to test us to see whether or not we deserve heaven, but he's trying to give us a playbook or a map in order to live this life with flourishing, with full, unbelievable joy through the worst and most trying and difficult of circumstances. This Jesus is not working against us. He is working for us and with us. And his coming interactions with people is when he, uh, when the rubber meets the road, when he truly shows himself to be who he is. It is so tempting to think that the Jesus who would teach this way of life that feels so difficult would be such a stubborn, hard man who would push and push and push us almost like that coach throwing things in the locker room. But Jesus is not like that. Jesus meets us where we are with grace and helps us through our hard times. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about sermons. We're going to do sermons that particularly talk about people coming to Jesus in their hardest of times, when they're at the end of their ropes, when they're struggling, broken, hurting, scared, ill, And we're going to examine who Jesus is when we're having our hardest time, when we're struggling the absolute most. Who is Jesus when we are in a hard place? And we find over and over and over that the Jesus who teaches us this way of life, which is something to aspire to that feels difficult, is also the same Jesus who comes to us in the mud and mire of this life when we're most struggling and helps walk us through it and out of it. He doesn't throw us the tools and say, figure it out yourself. He shows up and lives through the difficulty with us. This is helpful because I think sometimes when we begin to aspire power or fame or, or, or something incredible to someone, we become afraid of them. I, I have a story like that in my own life. When, when I was a, a child, my family transitioned from Boston to New Orleans because my, my dad was in the military and he got transferred. And in that transfer, I lived a bunch of, uh, around a bunch of other military brats, and all the boys loved baseball. It was the summer of 1990 that I made this move. And at that time, the worst team in baseball was the Atlanta Braves. And I was a Red Sox fan. I grew up as a Red Sox fan, and all these military brat kids kept saying to me, oh, you have to move to New Orleans? The only t- team that is ever on TV there is the Atlanta Braves. And I thought, no, no, I can't. they're awful. They are terrible. And everyone just kept saying, you're going to have to learn to like the Braves because you're never going to see the Red Sox on TV again. And this was, you know, my family didn't have enough money for cable, so we didn't even get an ESPN game. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'd better figure out something about this Braves team if that's the only baseball I'm ever going to get to watch. And so that summer, they drafted a player out of Florida named Chipper Jones. He was the first player in the, uh, drafted in the entire draft that year. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to follow this guy all the way through the minor leagues until he gets to the pros, and this is how I'm going to connect with the South. And so I watched Chipper Jones all the way through the minor leagues, and that was hard to do in that time. And so I would buy magazines, and I would get baseball cards, and I would check his statistics constantly to see how close he was to getting to the major leagues. 
And eventually he made it to the major leagues, won a World Series and won an MVP and is now in the Hall of Fame. But he became my favorite player through middle school and high school because I connected to him in this big transition in my life. And I had this moment and chance to meet him. He was in Milwaukee, uh, which is where I went to high school, and he was playing for the Braves. And my wife now, we were dating at the time, for our high school graduation bought me tickets to go see Chipper Jones play baseball against the Brewers. And so we showed up as soon as the stadium was open. We were right, we were about 20 rows behind the Braves dugout, and he kept bouncing out, getting ready for the game. And I'm usually not very shy about introducing myself to people or walking right up to people. And so one time I saw him out there and he was preparing some of his bats and it was well before the game. And I was still a kid, so I thought they probably wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't dismiss me like they would an adult. And so I looked over at Sharice and I said, I'm going to talk to him. And I got out of my seat and I started beelining down the steps towards the bottom to meet my hero. And I got halfway there when this overwhelming feeling moved from my gut all the way through my chest into my throat. And I thought, what if he's a jerk? Now, I I have no particular reason to believe that he's a jerk. Chipper Jones, if you're watching this today, I don't think you're a jerk. But I didn't know. I was afraid that all of what he had meant to me, all of the story that I had built up about him, all of the mythology in my own life about this one baseball player could have been ruined if he ignored me or told me to go away. And so I stopped on the steps and I turned around and I went back to my seat and I watched him as a ball player from a distance rather than telling him my story because I was afraid I was afraid that approaching him could ruin everything that I thought about him. But Jesus doesn't work that way. Jesus, we're going to see in the coming weeks, is for sure one who is approachable. As much as we may have built up a story about him as graceful and kind, as much as we can believe that he's a healer, we may become intimidated by that in the teachings and the stories of Christianity that we've heard. But we're going to learn over and over that outsiders, insiders, sinners, holy people, no matter where you are on the spectrum, people come to Jesus with their struggles, their hurts, their illnesses, they come in the worst time in their lives, and Jesus receives them with grace each and every time. So if you find yourself in these days really struggling, as if you are caught in the hardest of places, this is not the worst time to be caught between a rock and a hard place. Because the rock isn't pushing back against the hard place in this metaphor. The rock is saying, let the hard place go and build your foundation on me. I will lay down my life so that you can build your life on top of a foundation that's secure. And the things that are so hard that keep coming at us, that keep pushing at us, Jesus is reaching out his hands to us and saying, come with me, let it go. Turn the struggles aside. Let go of the pain, the anxiety, the fear, the hurt, the anger. Let it go and find that your life can flourish when it's built on top of me. Jesus receives us with grace each and every time. And my hope and prayer is that if you have been struggling or teetering on the edge of faith and you've been wondering whether or not to throw your life into it or away from it, Jesus receives you with grace and kindness. Jesus wants to know you, to hear from you. He will not turn you away. No matter what your prayer would be, no matter how beautiful it is or how weak it is, Jesus will hear your prayer today to say, Lord, I want to build my life on you. I want to let go of the things that have consumed me, that have been difficult, the reasons that I won't give myself fully to you. I want to build my life on you. And Jesus will open his heart and his life to you and will answer that prayer every time. If you're wondering what next steps would be to find a life of faith 
in Christ. Please utilize the tools that Pastor Jeff talked about earlier. You can email us at prayer at uh, crossroadsnaz.org. You can email me at timbrooks at crossroadsnaz.org. Please let us know how you're wrestling with faith so that we can come alongside of you and help lay out a roadmap of how to live as a person who is a Christ follower, finding that flourishing, solid life, strong life is built on him as the rocky foundation. If you would, would you join me as we sing this final song today as we worship him? This song is called Build My Life. Just like Pastor Tim said, let's build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. None beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus the only one that could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my
is in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me receive this blessing as we close today as the winds and the waters rise As life gets difficult and feels hard, may you find that building your life on Jesus Christ has been the foundation that will weather you through difficult times. And as the winds and the waves rise this week, turn yourself to him and find that he is still graceful and strong to help you through the most difficult of times. He loves you and will be there for you. Amen. We'll see you again next Sunday morning.